Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Backroom Electronics. Today I'm beginning a new series. I'm looking at four parts at this point, although that can definitely change, talking about the fundamentals of radio communication. Now while a lot of people have talked about the historical side, not too many have gone into the technical aspect. However, to understand the technical side, we do still need to know some of the history, so I will be including some of that as well. So I haven't talked too much about why I enjoy radio communication, antique electronics, vacuum tube electronics as a whole, but here's a good chance to talk about some of that. When I was a kid, some friends and I pulled together our lemonade stand money and purchased a crystal radio kit from Radio Shack. We assembled it in his living room, and it wasn't that great. It could really only pick up one radio station, the most strong radio station in town, and everything else was just dead air. And because my friend's parents were definitely not going to let us run a large dipole through the middle of their house, that was about all we got. Later on, I, we moved houses and had a, an elderly neighbor who was quite the funny old lady. Once she found out that I had an interest in vacuum tube electronics, she doorbell ditched a box of old radio components. Among them was an old GE All-American 5 radio. I used to listen to that radio endlessly. Every single night I would run that radio. And I listened to that radio station that we could pick up with the Crystal Radio just endlessly until I moved to Utah where I live today. Those two receivers, the Crystal Receiver I built as a kid and that All-American 5 radio, both handily shaped my interest as an adult. The Crystal Receiver in particular was interesting because it requires no power supply, no batteries, no nothing. It just receives radio and puts it out through the headphones. I can only imagine the magical feeling that those who were first being exposed to radio in the 1910s and 1920s must have felt. Here's where the history lesson comes into play. In 1874, Carl Ferdinand Braun discovered that the interface between a metal and its oxide can serve as a diode. This is known today as a point contact diode, and was basically the first semiconductor. By 1902, G.W. Pickard discovered that you can use that point contact diode to decode radio signals. This was a crystal receiver and was the most predominant method of listening to radio until being superseded by more tube amplified methods in the 1920s. To compare, the U.S. Standards Bureau in 1922 released a publication detailing how to create your own crystal receiver for $10 or $150 in today's money. To compare that, the Music Master Type 60 that I have right here ran for $60 or $875 in today's money. Not very affordable. On top of that, you had to pay for batteries and pay to charge the batteries and refresh the batteries and, and keep the, everything running with the radio, which was itself not cheap either. Now, remember when I said the crystal receiver was superseded by tube amplified methods in the 1920s? That's only partially correct. We'll get to the how of this in a future video, but during World War II, the Nazis had outlawed radio receivers and had ways of detecting the use of more modern receivers. Now, since the crystal receiver consumes no power and radiates no energy of its own, it was therefore undetectable. These were called foxhole radios and were crucial in the war effort. The workhorse is, of course, the crystal diode. That and a tunable capacitor to set the frequency that you're listening to are really all that you need to build a radio. To demonstrate what AM encoded radio looks like and how to decode it, I've put together a little bit of a demonstration to show you some of the ins and outs of radio reception. As you can see here, we've got this audio frequency that's down here and up here. It's generating actually a 400 hertz tone. That's coming from my signal generator. I've got a little AM signal generator that's set for, looks like, 10, I'm on. Eh, about almost six six megahertz it looks like at this point <clears throat> but if you can see you've got this large gap right here well this is what it looks like on an analog oscilloscope and and that's really all I have I don't have a digital oscilloscope but if we in, uh, shorten the time base here and zoom in we start seeing this well that's your radio frequency right there and if I actually come over here and hit measure and frequency, boom, 5.8 megahertz. So that's actually what the, the carrier frequency is, but it's modulating a 400, 400 hertz? Uh, I think it's a 400 hertz tone anyways. Uh, so 400 hertz tone is what actually comes out of, if I were to decode this, that's what you would actually hear. But if we shorten our time or lengthen our time base I guess would be more correct you get back to this point where you are seeing whoops 
And my scope is not going to hold off. Come on, stop that. You get back to this. So this is what a, a AM encoded signal is going to look like. So you've got your amplitude modulation on your 5.8 megahertz signal. So if that makes sense to you, then great. If not, uh, let me know in the comments and I'll go into more detail later. Uh, however, at this point, I am kind of expecting a little bit of understanding of how AM encoding works. But basically, this top edge here is going to be your audio frequency. And that's actually what a detector is doing, is it's going to chop this in half. So you're, you're only going to see from here up. And then with the capacitor smoothing, you're then only going to see this audio wave right here. And that's your 400 hertz tone. So if you are listening to an actual radio station that's creating more than just a 400 hertz tone, this would look like the audio waveform of whoever's talking, whoever's playing an instrument, what have you. But since this is the raw encoded signal, you do have this here. And this is, this is just part of AM encoding. FM encoding would have a frequency shift instead of this amplitude shift. Uh, and and we, we can go look at that at, at a later date on a future video. I do intend to show that when I get to that point. I do have an FM generator that I'm going to use as well to, to go through this. Uh, but yeah, so this, this is a raw AM encoded signal. And now what, we're, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a little bit more electronics here. I'm going to set up a second channel plugged in over here. So that way you can see both this and what the decoder is showing. And I'm going to start with just a silicon rectifier, so that way you can see what a silicon rectifier is going to look like. And then we will try a crystal rectifier, like what a crystal radio is going to show. So I'm going to go set that up, and we will resume. So now this is your AM modulated signal. That's what this is right down here, channel two. And up here on channel one, this is the detected version. So you can see how it just kind of cuts the bottom half off. And while you still have this little funny guy right here, I'm not really smoothing that with a capacitor. I'm just using a resistor across as a bleeder. And then I'm just running my, my silicon diode across uh, across that point. And if I were to connect a speaker across the resistor uh, over here, which is effectively going to be in parallel with the, with the resistor, you get a 400 hertz tone. And I'll demonstrate that here in a little bit when I get to a little bit more of a sensitive method. Uh, this doesn't really produce enough for me to show you because I'm using a silicon diode on this one. This is really only, it shows a 0.6 volt drop, right? Any silicon diode is gonna have a 0.6 volt drop across it. So this is not enough to really drive speakers. I'm not really gonna take the effort to try to drive a high gain amplifier into this thing. A Little bit of a pain, but I'll show you when I have a lower gain uh, or a lower voltage drop rectification method the silicon diode that I'm actually working on as we speak. So once I have that going, I will show that to you running through my Sonos, I believe is what I've decided on. And you'll be able to hear that 400 Hertz tone running through that. And, and this is actually what's going to come out of that 400 Hertz tone. It's this wave right here. Okay. Well, I wasn't expecting this to happen. Um, yeah, I wasn't expecting this to happen. This was not the result that I was getting just a minute ago. I'll have to include some of the B-roll of this. I, I got interrupted by my upstairs neighbor getting in and had to stop until he, he settled in and, and got his stuff taken care of and, and out of the bedroom above me. Uh, but a minute ago, I basically had the same result that I had with the silicon rectifier. And the silicon rectifier I was using, uh, since I know somebody's gonna ask, is the 1N007. Uh, just a basic silicon rectifier, nothing nothing special, nothing particular. I use them to replace selenium rectifiers. I'll cover that in a future video, the dangers of selenium rectifiers. But for now, uh, I did want to cover this here. This is a new, new development, like this just happened. This is actually the best audio waveform that I've gotten out of this crystal rectifier. Now this here is the Galena crystal that I've actually earmarked specifically for this project years ago. When I first moved to Utah, 
about 11 years ago, I wanted to, I, I used to be in a group that was all over Utah, wandering through mines to do surveying and other, other similar things. And they, I found this in the tailings pile just outside the mine. And I figured this would be a great one to try to make a crystal radio out of. This is a project that I've always wanted to do, you know, start with my own crystal that I found myself floating around somewhere where I was, where I was able to get a hold of it, uh, instead of buying it in a kit and going from there. So this is, this is a little bit of a bucket list item for me. This is actually a really neat, really neat demonstration. I'll have to, at the close of the video, include some of my B-roll of me bouncing around the house just excitedly over the fact that this actually worked. Uh, I and, and I knew it would, it's just I didn't know how easy it would be to make it work. I've always heard that these things are really fiddly, and sure, they're fiddly, but it's actually pretty easy to get a signal through it. Anyways, so this is, I, it basically just took a washer with three sheet metal, uh, sh sheetrock screws, not sheet metal, sheetrock screws to hold the the negative terminal of my point contact diode. So we have our point and our contact diode. And over here we have our AM signal as we saw before. Over here is our rectified signal and that's coming from this probe right here. That is this right here. And if we increase our attenuation, you're probably already hearing it, but just in case you're not, there we go. That's my signal being pulled through, detected with simply this piece of galena and this 47k ohm resistor. Whoop, I totally just blocked the camera, didn't I? Just this piece of galena and this 47k ohm resistor over here. That's all that, that's in the circuit. That and, and my probes and then my leads that are going off to my, uh, my Sonos over there that's, that's amplifying that sound. So that's literally all I have here. I mean, three, two components plus my amplifier. That's all you need for a crystal crystal receiver. It is a really neat, very simple design. And I mean, again, all you have is the interface between a metal and a mineral to, pro to provide your point contact diode. It's a really simple design. And so now that we've seen a demonstration of what a crystal detector looks like, Let's look at a full-on crystal receiver. Okay, so this video will not really be talking about the restoration of this radio. I will be covering that in a separate video later on. I do have most of the restoration already recorded. I do still have some things that I want to do to this radio yet to make it really smoothly working. And I haven't gotten to that point yet. But I did. the, the purpose of this video is more to talk about the fundamentals of how radio receivers work and starting from the ground up for with that now so this radio is already in a working state i have intentionally left off the recordings of the restoration itself but here is the radio now the radio itself had a wire sticking out the side uh, and i did have to do some tweaks to make this even function uh, you can see I sanded these because they were just not making any sort of contact. I had to sand the inside of these terminals just a little bit. Obviously, I've not cleaned this up very much. I just wanted to get it working so I could talk about the fundamentals of how a crystal receiver works. So let's talk about some of this, shall we? Now, up here is your tuning knob. And this controls a big variable capacitor, much like you see on any vacuum tube electronics we just have the gangs that mesh and unmesh as you, you turn this knob. Now this one will spin 360 degrees, whereas a more modern one won't. Uh, I also have this here. This is the range selector here. And as you can see, I sanded these a little bit because this was just not making any sort of contact. In addition, this was just loose and, and flopping around in the breeze. So I had to take all this down and, and tighten up from the bottom and, and fix some other things. I've got a chip out here and this piece that was missing is actually, I mean, it's actually just right. It was in the bottom of the radio when I opened it. So I'm going to glue that with some epoxy and see if I can't reattach the, the solder down there and make this a more complete receiver. As far as on the inside, well, let's talk about the outside first. Up here, you have your ground connection and your antenna connection. You have your crystal 
side right here. So this is where the crystal would have gone back in the day. And then you have your headphone connections. Now, if you watch Hand Tool Repair, I do actually have the exact same headphones that he posted not long ago. And I'm gonna do a restoration of them as well once I do the full restoration of this radio. But for right now, let me actually pick them up and bring them into shot so you can see that. These are actually, slide that out of the way. These are actually the exact same model headphones. You, you can see C brand is superior match tone headphones. The exact same model of headphones that Hand Tool Rescue, Hand Tool Rescue had. Uh, mine is missing little knobby guy up here. I don't know if I'm going to be able to find something similar to replace that with just to kind of keep that together and not all over the place. In addition, the wires are pretty frayed and they've been repaired a number of times over the years. But they do still have the original lugs and they still have the original cloth covered wire and these do still work. I actually use these when I was first building out the circuit before I, for the demonstration that, that you'll see here in a minute. The, when I was building out that circuit, I used this because they're going to be sensitive enough to listen to, you know, a crystal receiver. So they're definitely going to be sensitive enough to listen to the little receiver that I built that was receiving radio directly injected from my frequency generator. So these things are pretty gross and they definitely need some love but that will be for a different video as well. Now, as for the principle, op principle of operation, let's get this pulled out here. And as you can see, this box is pretty sad. There's no way I'm gonna be able to fix this. That's just going to have to be, it's just gonna have to be the, the way this radio is from now on. It's not gonna be able to sit in any sort of uncontrolled environment anymore, but I never would have done that anyways, so it doesn't really matter. So here's the tuning gang right here, and this is the exact same way we still do it. Well, we did it up through the tube era. You can see how it meshes and unmeshes, but it will turn a full 360. It's not just a knob on top turning a full 360. It is actually the, the, the tuning capacitor itself. Now, you notice that they will actually impact. That's because this is actually meant to be used in this orientation where it will freely spin. I did have these gangs right here were hitting the the fixed portion of the variable capacitor and I did have to fix that a little bit. Uh, this wire was the one that was loose and just hanging out the side of the radio. I had to reattach that, figure out where it went first of all and reattach it. And then this right here was just loose and flopping around in the breeze. And yeah, so anyways, principle, principle of operation. So from your antenna connection, which would be these guys back here, from your antenna connection, let me actually rotate that so it's easier for you to see because the camera is actually in front of me. From your antenna connection, this guy right here, this goes up to your aerial. And when radio waves strike this, it creates an electrical current in the exact same frequency as the radio wave itself. And it's kind of almost like induction, but not induction because it's not magnetic. It's, it's electronic or electrical is, I guess, more correct. So because it is inducing that frequency in this coil of wire through the antenna, this coil of wire and this coil of wire here, you're using this with all these, all these little tie points all through here. See if you can see that. There we go. So you can see all those tie points all through there. That is attached to the range selector that is right here. As you can see, all that's doing is shortening and lengthening that coil of wire. So what you're doing is you are creating basically a, an oscillator of sorts. It's not really an oscillator because it's not, it's not generating a signal. It is receiving a signal and it is oscillating on that frequency. Now, to create an oscillator, you need a capacitor, a coil, and a switch of some kind. That would be a vacuum tube, a transistor, or in this case, a diode. So think of this like the inverse of, a, of an oscillator. You have a signal coming in through the antenna signal that is inducing a 
movement of electricity, a current of electricity throughout this receiver that is being tuned both by the length of wire on this coil right here and the variable capacitor down here at the bottom. Now, because that frequency is too much for a, a pair of headphones to receive, uh, I think of a good way to, to describe this. Basically, what's happening with a speaker, and let me pull this out of the way and bring this back in. With a speaker, if you are feeding it a frequency of, say, 500 kilohertz, 500 kilocycles, as you'll see with a lot of antique electronics, what's going to happen is this is going to this diaphragm that's down here that actually should just come right off. Hey, hey. Oh, that's actually beautiful. Uh, that diaphragm, this right here, is actually going to be vibrating at 500 some odd kilohertz. Let's just say 500 kilohertz. But because that's not able to move its full travel, and it's not really, it's basically just going to flutter a little bit, if anything at all, effectively what's happening is nothing comes out this diaphragm. So what we're doing instead is we're taking that diode and because a diode let me actually draw this out for you I wanted to walk through the schematic with you and it's gonna be easiest if I just draw this out and show you first of all the most basic uh, circuit schematic for a crystal receiver now basically what you're going to have now with any radio you're gonna have what's called your antenna ground network. Now in the middle here, what you're actually going to have is you're going to have your coil of wire that runs down to ground. Now over here and over here on one side you're going to have your diode. So let's put a diode in and then across here what you're going to have is your variable capacitor and then over here, what you're going to have, and I'm going to use old symbols because that's the way I see it in most books that I'm looking at. So this is basically the most simple crystal radio schematic that you can have. So you have, as I said, you have your variable capacitor, your diode, and your coil. Now, remember, to create a, an oscillator, you just replace this with a switch of some kind, a vacuum tube, a transistor, something that's switching on and off based off of when the pulse comes through that variable capacitor. There's other changes. I'm way oversimplifying. We'll go into more depth later on, but think of this like the inverse of, a, of an oscillator. So what's going to happen is radio waves are going to strike this antenna and are going to induce a flow of electricity, and induce is probably the wrong word, but you're going to have a flow of electricity down through this coil, through ground, but that electricity is still going to continue down this line. Now this variable capacitor right here, and this is the symbol for a variable capacitor, is going to want to change the frequency that this coil oscillates at. Now what that's going to do is because this antenna is receiving all frequencies, in a given bandwidth plus all harmonics above that and it gets extremely complex. I'm not going to go too terribly far into depth on that. But because you have the because you have this basically being tuned to a given frequency, the only thing that's coming through here is the frequency that this has set it to. So let's say that's 500 kilohertz, right? So you have your electricity that's actually bidirectional because this signal isn't just a positive signal, it's also going to be pulling electricity that's going to be bidirectional, right? Alternating current, right? Now this diode is going to stop that action. So what you're going to have is instead of having your, your AC signal that comes in and kind of looks like this, you're instead going to have this cut at the zero point now because you were going positive, you know, 500 millivolts, negative 500 millivolts, let's use round numbers just for simplicity's sake, it's never going to be that much from the antenna. Because you're going positive and negative the same amount, 
you basically have a net voltage of zero across this circuit. So what you're going to do is with this diode, you're going to cut this bottom part off, and now here is your waveform. Now that's basically a sine wave. As you saw on the AM radio demonstration, you can see that 400 hertz tone superimposed on this really high frequency, this radio frequency and the whatever frequency I had it set to. Now because you now have just a push upward that's basically going to instead, this headphone, instead of being pushed out and then pulled in and then pushed out and then pulled in at this 500 kilohertz frequency, what is instead going to happen is every time you have your bump that comes up, the headphone is going to be pushed just a little bit, and then a little bit more, and then a little bit more, and then a little bit more as it goes up the waveform. So that is why this is basically able to decode AM radio. It's such a simple, elegant design. And so basically you're just going to have your diaphragm that just pushes out, and then as it comes back, it just returns to its resting point down here before being pushed out again by the increasing amplitude of the modulated signal. Okay, so now that we've looked at the most simple crystal radio schematic that you can see, let's now have a look at what this radio is doing. So effectively, what you have, just like with every single radio that you will ever look at, you will have your antenna through a coil this one is actually funny, and I'll show you why this here in a second, but at the bottom you have your ground connection, okay? Now, because you have 12 taps, I'm not going to draw them all out, but I'll draw a few out. Then you have your switch, 12 taps. This is your range selector that I was talking about, and this is that coil with all those taps on it that I was showing you. You still have this because this is one of the taps at the very bottom of this coil, and you still want some of the coil there to resonate at the highest frequency there. From there, we run off, and we have this line that runs off through here. We run up through our variable capacitor, and then across here we have our headphone and right here that I forgot you have your diode. Now the diode is on that socket as I showed. This is that variable capacitor that big coil with all the taps on it and then that weird side coil is this guy right here. So effectively what's happening is you have radio waves that are striking the antenna and creating an electrical current through this coil of wire. Now this coil of wire, coupled with the length being set by this switch, is setting the frequency along with this variable capacitor to certain frequencies along the range. I've not actually gone through and figured out what the different ranges are, but uh, obviously up here at the longest one you have the lowest frequency and up here where you have less coil that's being traversed by the electricity you have the highest frequency. Then here you have your diode and then your headphones. I'm using an old symbol there's other symbols out there for headphones that we could use but let's stick to the old symbols that I'm familiar with that I learned on because right I'm self-taught. So I was talking about how this is effectively the inverse of an oscillator, or at least this section right here is effectively the inverse of an oscillator. And I wanted to talk a little bit more about what that means. Now, effectively what's happening is as radio waves strike the antenna, they will induce a current through the, through the coil here. Now that coil is, is attached to this capacitor, and what's going to happen is that electricity is going to flow into the capacitor and the capacitor is going to charge. Then that radio wave, as it comes in from a peak and goes down into a trough, what's going to happen is that voltage coming off of this antenna is going to drop, and this capacitor is going to discharge back into the, the coil here. 
The other thing that's going to happen here is we're going to have some reactants. So the coil is going to establish a magnetic field and that is going to exert a reverse pressure on the, or a reverse voltage on the coil itself. Now the other thing that's going to happen with this, this coil establishing a magnetic field is once this voltage tapers, you're going to have that magnetic field collapse and it's going to fire a pulse this way. So you're going to have, first of all, you're going to have a pulse that fires off this way that finishes charging the capacitor. Then the capacitor is going to discharge back into this magnetic field or into this coil that's then going to charge the coil and generate a magnetic field that's then going to collapse and is again going to fire current back this way. So this is basically the exact premise behind an oscillator. And we'll see oscillators again later once we get to the superheterodyne radio uh, because those become critically important to understanding what a superheterodyne is and how it operates. But for now, this is basically just the inverse of an oscillator. Instead of generating a frequency, it's reacting to a frequency and creating a, a, an alternating current out instead of just a random pulse here and there from this 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 and radio wave striking the antenna all right so that about wraps it up for the crystal radio if you like what you saw be sure to give me a thumbs up and subscribe for more for more videos like this catch you next time mm -hmm.